You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with journalist and author Rachel Shabby and former Conservative Special Advisor Salma Shah. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Roads on fire, that's the front of the metro, as thousands of holidaymakers and locals scramble to escape the wildfires sweeping the Greek holiday island. The Express describes the situation as hell on earth. Our terror, the Mirror has spoken to a number of British tourists stranded in roads as the flames threaten. This is the sun, the headline, run for your lives from what it calls the road's wildfire hell. Same lead story in The Guardian, which says Greece has mounted its biggest ever evacuation operation on the island. The Eye reports that as roads burns, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is being warned not to row back on any of his green policies, even though some have been labelled as unpopular and expensive. The Mail speaks to Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, who's been diagnosed with skin cancer, but is thankful that it was caught early. The Financial Times leads with news that powerful Republican donors could start pulling funding from presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis because his policies may be too far to the right. And The Star reports that unfit Brits are to get more time to cross the road at Pelican Crossings. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by journalist and author Rachel Shabby and former Conservative Special Advisor Salma Shah. Welcome to you both. Um, let's start with the Metro and uh, many of the, the front pages covering the wildfires uh, in Greece, particularly in Rhodes. Um, we know now spreading to, I think, 18 uh, districts in Corfu. But that, that uh, front photograph of people fleeing up to 19,000 um, to safety. Rachel, take us into this story. Yeah, the words and images coming out of roads at the moment are absolutely horrifying. Um, the Metro has an inset picture with roads on fire and um, has captioned it apocalyptic. And it does, it looks apocalyptic, it looks dystopian. Um, people who have been trapped in this have described it as you know, a living hell, a living nightmare, the end of the world, just horrendous, horrendous scenes of people desperately trying to flee these fires, um, you know, running to beaches, thousands of people on beaches, trying to scrabble to catch coaches to, to evacuate, um, ash falling from the sky, the sea turning black, um, absolutely horrendous, horrendous images. And, and of course, it's, it's devastating because all these people would have would have saved really hard, especially hard this year, the cost of living crisis to go on a holiday that would have been needed more than ever because of the strain of the cost of living crisis. And of course, Greece so reliant on the tourist industry as well. These these summer months are so vital to sustain the economy. So it is, it's just devastating to see the news coming out of roads today. And, and as you say, now also call for... Yes, yes, so sad to see. And we, with that picture, we can see people having to, to flee in, in flip-flops and we're, we read that they're having to trek for miles to, to get to safety just in flip-flops and, and swimwear often, Salma. Yes, and that's that's also really evident in, in the shocking nature of the photographs because clearly people were not prepared uh, to be facing this kind of trauma whilst on holiday. And as you say, you're seeing people in their swimwear, you're seeing people having to carry children, very young children, uh, for miles to try and get to some kind of safety. And as Rachel just alluded to, um, you know, Greece is very dependent on tourism and the reaction from the Greek authorities on how they're going to evacuate, the largest evacuation of its kind in their history, um, is going to bear pressure down on them 
right now in the immediate emergency, um, but also looking forward, you know, they are going to have to have some kind of reconstruction effort. And I think people are going to think twice before they go to Greece uh, in the future. So, you know, they're going to have to consider the impact on their uh, tourism economy as well. So shocking images from uh, a human uh, element and also just further down thinking about the reaction to the emergency and then again in the medium term as to what's going to happen to the industry going forward. Yes, and we, we moved to the Express and uh, we know that 19,000 people at least have been evacuated. Um, tourism departments in, in Greece initially saying that it was contained to a, a small area um, of roads, but the, the picture increasingly looking that that this is, is spreading and it, it can't be um, described as a contained event, Rachel. Yeah, that's right. And, and as you've been reporting um, so well, your correspondence from uh, the area earlier, uh, there's the, the wind factor. It is, is this so windy um, that it's, that's what's making it so uncontainable. It is it is spreading at such an alarming rate because of that wind factor that's exacerbating the situation already. But, but you know, it, it's impossible now to deny the reality of the climate emergency that we're in. And um, some are quite rightly uh, raised concerns around the short and medium term future for, for Greece of having to reconstruct. But also, you know, this is the reality when we've got 1.2 degrees of um, heating, global heating, and we're only projected to get worse. So what's this going to look like next year and in the years to come if we don't manage to get the climate emergency under control? And, and even if we did do something now, this is a reality that's going to be with us for years to come. So it is something that we need to think about much further down the line as well. Yes, Emma, there's a quote from a uh, holiday maker, British holiday maker, who ran down a, a dirt track with her daughter, five-year-old daughter, with, with smoke all around them, and she admitted, I, I thought I was, I was going to die. It was like hell on earth. But at, at the same time, we hear that some holiday makers feel that they haven't been supported by their, their holiday operators in, in terms of uh, information and, you know, where they should evacuate to. We know some people arrived uh, today, I believe, on flights, um, and their, their hotel had, had burnt down. Yeah, and this is the, the reality of an emergency situation like this, which wasn't predicted and is clearly something that is going to be difficult for the authorities to manage because of the scale of it. And you'll also see through the papers and indeed in your own reporting this evening, the number of people who are now sort of sleeping on airport floors waiting to find a way to get out. And that's all going to be impacted because of this climate situation. Um, and I think that I don't think the the sort of harrowing nature of this is going to end or be easily reconciled with kind of easy flights back home. And there is going to have to be a real rapid um, reaction from the Greek authorities about what they're going to do in order to shut down new flights that are coming in, think about which other islands this could potentially spread to, and also prevent uh, holiday makers who will come from all over over Europe, uh, at a minimum, uh, from making that journey. So they're going to have to really think hard about what their um, what their sort of emergency reaction is going to be to that now. Mm. Uh, and Rachel, you alluded to it before, but how do you think all of this is going to impact tourism? Um, obviously, in the, the immediate uh, weeks and uh, months to come, but but in, in the future, in terms of you know going to these these types of uh, countries, these these islands. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's obviously going to have an impact, and there's you know there's so many knock-on effects of the climate emergency, and and this is one of them. I, I was in uh, Corfu just recently, and it's it's very clear on that island, like many uh, of these tourist resorts uh, or, or countries that attract holidaymakers over the summer months, that those months actually sustain those areas for the rest of the year. They're entirely dependent on that economy over the summer. 
uh, to, to keep them going over the winter in, in very many cases. And so that idea of having to, you know, re-pivot or recalibrate an entire economy is just a huge, huge undertaking, isn't it? Um, but but this, is, this is the reality that we're in. Um, as, as we were talking about before, this is at 1.2 degrees of global warming. We're only set for that to increase. It's only likely to get worse. And that is even if we try and take the drastic measures that are required now, which, as we've seen, uh, there's currently no political appetite to do. Let, let's and then bringing that in mind, let's move to the Metro uh, Salma and their story. Um, the headline there, it's still got the green light. Uh, Khan won't back down on ULEZ rollout. In terms of um, green credentials, we've seen sort of both political parties almost wanting to, to shed them um, immediately or as quickly as they can, because um, we know with ULEZ in particular, it's not been very popular. No, indeed. And obviously, this is very front of mind for us in, in terms of the policies and uh, the sort of green agenda as it is uh, for, for all major political parties in this country and beyond. And we have this very localised issue of ULEZ, which is limiting uh, the, the speed at which you can drive in outer London boroughs. And it currently exists in central London and it's going to be expanded out. And that's what the mayor wants. This has now been considered as one of the reasons that the Labour Party didn't manage to win back Uxbridge, the former prime minister's constituency uh, from the Conservatives because uh, people didn't seem to want it. And it's that difficulty that all politicians are going to face is having to deal with climate change and those incremental policies and measures that they can bring in to try and affect that change versus what their voting public actually want. And, you know, it's going to require some leadership and it's going to require perhaps saying things to people that they don't necessarily like. And as we all know, politicians aren't always very good at that. But Rachel, what did you um, make of the differences between Sakir Starmer and uh, the mayor, Sadiq Khan, in terms of, you know, Sakir coming out publicly and saying that, you know, the mayor probably has to, to rethink. I mean, that's not a, a good look for Labour, is it? No, I mean, I, I actually was appalled to see uh, Sakir basically chuck the London mayor under the bus over that. And I, I'm actually appalled at the way that Labour has allowed this, um, the Uxbridge by-election result to be spun in this way. Look, there's no evidence. Look, that Labour hasn't won that seat in, you know, at least 50 years. Not even Tony Blair in his landslide 97 election won that seat. There were 500 votes in it. Who's to say that those 500 votes weren't about people not liking Sakir or not liking <laughs> his refusal to back down on the two-child um, benefits cap? So the idea that we're going to spin this into a Ulez is unpopular narrative is dismaying. It's dismaying that Labour will play along with that. And all credit to the London Mayor Sadiq Khan for standing firm on a policy that is about uh, dealing with air pollution and not least because that actually saves lives. 4,000 deaths in London alone due to air pollution, but also is, is looking at some way of, of dealing with, with the climate emergency. And, and the idea that this policy, which nine out of 10 cars in London aren't affected by, which at the moment there are um, measures to subsidise people who need it, i.e. people on low income, um, people who are disabled and so on. Uh, it's absolutely ludicrous that Labour is even considering pivoting away from um, measures to deal with air pollution okay. and the climate emergency because of, frankly, spin that they've they've rolled over on. Okay. It's absolutely Ra dismayed. Rachel and Salma, for the moment, thank you. We are going to take a break coming up. The Metro marks the attack on an Odessa cathedral by Russia. More on that and other stories when we come back. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, journalist and author Rachel Shabby and former Conservative Special Advisor Salma Shah. Let's um, take a look now at the Metro and this really um, showing that the devastation um, 
wrought on Odessa, this attack on a cathedral, the 18th century Transfiguration Cathedral, which is a World Heritage Site, um, and one person killed and 22 others injured, including three children. Salma. Yes, I think this is a really interesting story for a number of reasons. One, because the image of this World Heritage Site, a cathedral, a place of worship, what is supposed to be, it was supposed to be a peaceful place, is really symbolic of, you know, the destruction that uh, they're facing in Odessa. Um, but also the fact that this is clearly a strategic attack by the Russians because the port of Odessa is where Ukraine's grain, that is the breadbasket of Europe, is coming from. So whilst um, Kyiv is trying to push through and this counteroffensive to take back its territories that have been taken by Russia, the Russians seem to be playing quite a hard game here by uh, trying to essentially prevent a lot of that um, shipping from happening and also as you've rightly pointed out, um, still sort of invoking civilian casualties, especially with children, and now, as I say, symbolically, this World Heritage Site. Yes, and we read, uh, Rachel, that the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, um, says that uh, Russia will feel the retaliation. Yeah, um, which which he would would have to say. I mean, this is a devastating uh, attack um, in in a in a series of attacks from Russia that have been pretty devastating all round. And it is, um, as Selma says, it's a shocking image to see this cathedral, UNESCO uh, heritage site, just in in ruins, um, and uh, religious figures there calling it barbaric, calling it. Uh, terrorism, scrambling to to save um, precious art artifacts or what they can, uh, while continuing to hold pray prayers inside. Um, but it, it, it's pretty, it's ruthless. It's a ruthless attack, um, precisely because it is the uh, point at which um, the grain can leave. Ukraine uh, and, and trying to stop that from happening uh, at a time when I think Russia just pulled out of a, a deal that was agreed over uh, grain exports. Um, this is a horrendous, horrendous way to go about it. Salma, take us to the uh, Financial Times, the front page of the Spanish general election. They've uh, been at the polls today. Yes, and as was widely expected, um, they, they assumed that there was going to be a right-wing surge that was going to remove uh, a, a left-wing government, but it doesn't seem to have quite worked out that way. So this clear-cut election that was supposed to take place now, now seems to be hanging in the balance. And I think there's been a quite actually, not just on the front page of the FT, but elsewhere in the papers uh, today, talking about actually how there is a bit of a surge across Southern Europe of right-wing figures. So you've got Italy that's that's taken on a right-wing prime minister in, in Georgia Maloney, and then you've now got this push that's coming again uh, into Spain, but it hasn't quite been as clear-cut. And maybe this is a theme that we're going to be seeing across Europe when we have uh, a number of elections in, in 2024, not, not least our own. Indeed. Uh, we've just got time, I think, to, to go to the mail. We'll move on to another story just to get the, this story in. And this is Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, speaking about his uh, cancer diagnosis. Rachel. Yeah, he says he's he's blessed that it was caught early. This is skin cancer. And, and yeah, absolutely, that it, that is a blessing. It's Cancer is evil. It's critical to find it early. It was diagnosed by the NHS. Um, thankfully, uh, which obviously is is very good at doing its job, given the time, given the resources and given the funding. Um, but I think um, Jeremy Hunt is also using this to raise a sort of awareness campaign uh, around, um, you know, getting things checked out. So uh, moles and other skin issues that have changed in appearance and the necessity of getting those checked out, particularly over the summer months. So, um, yeah, good that he caught that early. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that that's the same for anyone who's unfortunate enough to experience anything like this. Yes, indeed, and is urging Britain to lead the global fight against the disease. Uh, Rachel and Salma, thank you for taking us through the papers.